But we're going to continue on with questions and answers now since we are cutting time close. Um, so I'll hand it over to Richard. And if anyone does have a question, we have a microphone over here. Um, or if you stand up and speak very loudly, I'll ask the um, authors or Richard to repeat the question. Please. Thank you. All right, so it's open to the floor. Yes. Uh, what? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, there, there, there are actually some disputes about about his dates, and um, most um, most uh, accounts of his life say that he died in uh, uh, 1879. But in fact, only recently it was discovered that he died in 1859, uh, and um, he uh, had travelled a lot and he acquired some exotic disease abroad and died of that at a, at a young age. Uh, there are two, the complication is that there is another illustrator, also called Mahoney, who worked in London at the same time, and he was the one who was Dickens' illustrator. And the two are very often conflated, but they were very different characters. Anyone else? Yes. I think, I mean, the question of anonymity, I mean, definitely comes into question because at one level the British government apparatus was meticulous in statistical inquiry. And it's kind of ironic that the Society for Statistical Inquiry was founded during the Great Famine to keep tabs to statistical correlations. But meanwhile, <coughs> in that statistical series of abstractions. Real bodies died. But, there's an, but there is an argument. Luke, could you pull the mic just a little bit closer? Yeah. There go. But one of the, if I was to develop this in that direction, it, it could be argued, I think it's, I think it's, actually he might be at here, Joseph Roach, a, a, a theatre critic, who has related Beckett's work to the Great Famine. But Roach is famous for writing a book about African-American culture. And his, and his argument is that when <coughs> the mind is cancelled out and when language collapses, all that's left is the body. And he argues that African-American culture took the hit so hard in terms of anonymity, in terms of names, that dance and music become the last outpost of the beleaguered body, because dance and music are the, are, are the last things to go. So, so Roach has written, I mean, and, and it, it cannot but be bound up with the notion of the revival in Ireland. Admittedly, two generations later, but it could, it could be seen that the Celtic revival, so-called, was, as Seamus Dean has put it, a, a society coming out of colonial concussion, that the society is so concussed that it takes almost two generations to get back on its feet. And that's how one might see. So, and you could even argue that the revival 
is almost sim symbolized in Christy Mahan in the play by the Western world, a kind of a, a lout or a kind of someone who's lost his compass or literally lost his compass, he doesn't know where he is, lost his sat nav, as we say nowadays. And Christy then enters a community and he's made a hero. He finds his voice. He doesn't deserve it, but he finds his voice. And it's almost as if that's a metaphor for what's going on with the society itself coming out. Interesting enough, he has to kill his father to do it. So, so one, one of the issues that comes out of this is how then you cannot empathize with anything other than an individual or a face. And if the face <laughs> is eliminated, there's no sympathy. And this argument about that the, the faces were so emaciated that human beings could not relate to them. So in a sense, they were, they were dead even before they actually made it to the grave. That's it. So, so there are very complicated issues in that. So thanks for that question. Yes. Definitely. One question that I would ask is, um, what was the bearing on politics of Ireland in, after the famine? My name is Austin Stack. I'm from Wethersfield, Connecticut. And uh, the history of the uh, family goes way back to when the politics were after the famine. And what were the repercussions of the politics after the famine? Uh, uh, that's a great question. It's a very large question. Um, even during the famine, politics in Ireland was very divided. So Daniel O'Connell was still alive. He died in May 1847, and he led a constitutional movement to get independence from Ireland. But some of his followers broke away, and in 1848 they led a rebellion, the Young Island Rebellion, which lasted three hours. Um, most of them went into exile, some were sent to Tasmania, etc. But essentially, in the post-famine world, Irish politics were very fractured. And you can imagine the dislocation that followed, etc. And a revival came largely because of emigration. Those Irish who made it to North America, who in some ways carried the flame of Irish independence, and in 18, I hope I get my date right, 1857, a new movement was founded in America, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And the man who founded it, uh, John Mahoney, had actually taken part in the 1848 uprising. At the same time, the Fenian movement was founded in Ireland um, by James Stevens, also part of 1848, and they chose physical force. They rejected the constitutional methods of Daniel O'Connell and they delayed a rising until after the end of the American Civil War and there was a rising in 1867 which the British government knew all about and put down and then the pendulum swung yet again back to constitutional nationalism in the form of Home Rule, Charles Stuart Parnell, etc. So it keeps changing and then as Lucas said, one of the backdrops to this is the rise of cultural nationalism, which is a very important aspect of Irish politics. But I think essentially what happens as a result of the famine and mass emigration is that Irish politics, the struggle for Irish independence, is never confined to the island of Ireland again. North America becomes very much part of that struggle. Thank you. So, Mick, and then Dan um, Yeah, something um, <clears throat> flashed up a book there by Susan Moeller, um, and maybe think of something she wrote, because she, she writes that um, the use of women and children in images are there in a way to express innocence, but also to, um, I suppose, get away from trying to explain the complex that simply shows sort of how innocence is being destroyed or whatever. You don't really have to deal with the, the, the issue of that. And I'm wondering if during the famine, the illustrations the illustrated on the news of women and children are actually performing the same function that you you show innocence that they clearly are not involved in what the illustrated on the news probably was called outrages that men were involved in them. Um, but also it means you don't have to explain the famine itself. You could just have sort of innocence destroyed. And if that's the case, it's an interesting thing because we, we see a trend starting possibly in the famine and going through to present day wars and um, famines in, in the country. But is that 
Is that how it was with the illustrations on the news that the Roman children had had that function? Is that for Neve or for Catherine? Yeah. You'd like to take it. Look. Do you want to take Look. it? Well, I, I just say one thing, but I'll hand it over. One of the issues I try and address in the in my pamphlet is that Hannah Arendt argues that the use of compassion and sympathy is politically very precarious because she argues that by eliciting compassion and sympathy, you thereby forego questions of justice and politics and public, the public sphere. So she argues that the eliciting of sentimental responses, she says, why the, the do appeal to NGOs and the do appeal to the vast outpouring of you know, sensitive responses to hunger and poverty, that don't contra arrest, compassion gets in the way of justice. And it doesn't allow then, exactly as you're saying, the issues that are causing, because they become then too abstract to elicit sympathy. So there really is a, the issue that the Great Famine exemplifies is in a way not too different from what, what's going on today. I mean, it's not just confined to Ireland, that issue, but how you bring justice. So one of the things I was trying to do was showing that justice does come in through a, obligation. In other words, it's very important that we close the gap between compassion and justice. So I would kind of take issue with Hannah Arendt, but Arendt has a radical distinction between them. So I was saying that at certain points, if you like, compassion is obligatory. It's not discretionary. And sympathy is not discretionary. It's obligatory. And to close the gap, when it's obligatory, then it enters the domain of justice. So I think one of the one of the big issues is how do you close the gap between compassion on the one hand, which is kind of discretionary, or it would seem to be, and justice, which is obligatory. So in a sense, sentimentality, you, you kind of gain, if you like, like the images of the Great Famine too, you, you gain a certain response. But I think you're right in saying that that can be at the expense of the bigger picture of what could, what are the what's the political economy of this process in the first place? But maybe I, I might just come in there very briefly as well. I, I, I think also I mean we, we expect an awful lot of a single image, and you know getting a compression of narrative of cause and effect into a single image is almost impossible, quite apart from the scale of the problem and the horror of it and so on. But images, it's very hard to get a sequence of narrative within a single image. And that's one of the kind of big debates about history painting and how it managed to do that. So when um, illustrators or artists became illustrators and they were trying to do it in that sense, all of those problems uh, come into play, all those pictorial problems and imaging problems come into play. Secondly, um, the, the complexity of the famine was so enormous and it depended on who was being addressed and who was reading what. So that had to be taken into effect. So if you were you know, a middle class Irish person or you were a wealthy British person or you were a whatever, you, you were reading the images according to your own kind of intellectual apparatus. And that has to be taken into account. And then thirdly, these images, we, you know, we isolate them and we show them here, but in fact they were they were serial images. It's almost like a, a kind of comic book now. And no one image carried any one full version of a story either. So it was how the images interrelate with, with each other. Sometimes there might be five or six images on one page. There were 32 images within each issue, each weekly issue. <clears throat> so they interacted with each other as well. So that greatly uh, adds, adds to the complexity of the story. But you are right to say that women and children carried a certain part of the message, and certainly the message that was applying to the public to think in terms of charitable works and charitable donations, and the, the images of women and children would have fed into that. Catherine, did you want to? Yeah, I would just add something to that actually. Well, there are two things. One is, I think Margaret Kelleher is absolutely right, that, um, the, that there was a sort of feminization of um, famine, which still happened up to famines in Bangladesh and places in 
the late 20th century. But I think another one that we have to really not put aside is the convention, conventions within art, and that is very much about men making art and women being, therefore, the symbolic carriers of all the things that men made art about. I mean, women were even the landscape at times. Um, and I think that carried on really until the feminist revolution in the 70s when people began to look at images that incorporated women and children in them in a different way. So I think Susan Muller is much more coming out of that post-feminist um, look reading of imagery than would have been applicable in the 19th century. I mean, I think it's much more then about the male artist and the female. Can I, can I just make a second? Um, what I was thinking of <coughs> was sort of the images, say, of Bridget O'Donnell, um, and say, images you get now coming out of maybe the war of Afghanistan, which is what I had in my own head, and I can recall um, um, the use of a child who family had the uh, bomb, she's standing there. It won a war with a girl with a green dress, of course. And the, the story that went with it was simply describing her, um, the horror she had gone through, but without any context in terms of the war itself. And so, and in a sense, I'm just wondering whether something like uh, Richard Don or other pictures that show women and children during the 19th century or during the famine, you know, whether there is sort of a, a, a direct line going through to the portrayal of modern disasters, whether it be war or famine, where women and children are still used in that same way to get over complexity by just simply showing innocence mm. and destroying it. Um, and that seems to be the argument from that to Susan Muller, for my reading. I haven't read Susan Muller, actually. <laughs> um, and I must do now because it sounds as if. It, She's got a lot of useful things to say, but I think I think you're right. There is a non-broken line, but it's a line that, for all its if, if existence, has been modified and altered throughout the period we're talking about. And of course, the same um, presentation of the victims continues into the current day. But I was just thinking. I've been thinking a lot actually about the way we're looking at the Ebola disaster um, in Africa now. And it seems there as if the representation of images is very much, it's very equally distributed actually across age groups and across the sexes. I don't see the same kind of deliberate pulling out the children and the women in the way that they did well, in, say, Bangladesh. I mean, in terms of if you have a war or you have um, a disaster, you do have <coughs> at least some way to see. You know, men committed outrages during the famine, according to you know, the British newspapers at the time. Uh, men produce the war in Afghanistan, the children don't do the women, but well, that's the how it's perceived. With Ebola, no one can be seen as having caused it, so you could then have an equal distribution of gender in terms of representation if you want to get across. Yeah, I don't think I don't it's simple. It's, I think, in relation to the famine, actually, the famine affected. It affected men, women and children fairly equally. I think women were as active in trying to overcome it or indeed, to a, Christine would be a better person to talk to than me about this one, but women took part in the food riots as much as the men did, for instance. Um, women as landlords and landladies um, were just as harsh in their treatment of their tenants as male landlords were. So I don't think we can make that distinction. I think it has much more to do with the conventions around imagery and also even if you just think of that the Ashling, the concept of the Ashling where you know it's the male poet who sees the vision of the woman, the woman is Ireland, the woman is whatever needs help and the man is going is the active agent. Um, I think that's where that comes from and I do think that that has changed a little bit in modern times but it's obviously nothing happens overnight. We have a, a question at the back. So yes, you've been waiting for some time. My turn, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there was a slide that uh, there was a statement made by Tony Blair. Do you know in her recent visit to Ireland did the Queen have anything to say? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> you want to come back again? Yes. Yes. Okay, I have a question about the alignment presentation, the slide presentation. Uh, there was not a slide of the 
monument in Dublin, the hunger along the river in Lithuania. Was there any reason for that? No, um, no, there wasn't, but I did, I suppose, slightly refer to that when I said that a lot of work was made during the Celtic Tiger that was quite assertively made in bronze and, and expensively made in bronze as a way of really saying we have succeeded now, we're all right, we don't need sympathy anymore, but this happened way back in the past when things were different. It worries me a little bit that um, objects like that particular one suggest that famine is over, that we don't, and I, I think we in Ireland have a special responsibility actually to famine in other parts of the world because of our experience of it and our history of it. And so that suggestion that maybe it's all right to list all the names of the donors to that monument who were wealthy people who gave money and therefore could have their names listed with it and so on. I think that compromises that in a way that artworks I like the... Um, they're on the ground, embedded into the, into the ground beside some of the figures. Um, and it's a growing list. They're still actually receiving money and adding names to that. That seems to me to pervert the cause of the monument and therefore to do exactly what people like Leotard and Irish Rogoff were saying, the presence of the monument creates a new kind of history and displaces the object for which, or the event for which the monument was intended to commemorate. Good, Catherine. Yes, Catherine Trump. The first an observation uh, in its presentation of uh, pictures of the illustrated London Louvre. Uh, it's very interesting to me because in my research on Boston's reaction to the famine, I found that the, uh, the Illustrated London News by the books of Ellen Peruch was what triggered the Brahmin uh, segment of the population in Boston to get into uh, efforts to raise money and send food to Ireland, which they did in the spring of 1847. So it's a very a good illustration of how that worked on this side of the Atlantic. But my, uh, my question, my problem has to do with uh, what has been the impact on Irish America and Irish Americans about this rediscovery of the famine and uh, the famine experience that began in the uh, 1990s. And how do we prevent that kind of rediscovery of the awful misery and suffering from becoming a paralyzing event uh, that, that, that simply continues uh, kind of uh, phobias about, about the British, about the English, and instead move that to a more liberating kind of intellectual experience that will raise the kind of compassion and conscience that, that Luke talked about. How do we do this in public history? I, I do some work in some groups up in the Boston area. Sometimes I just want to tear my hair out because I just hear the same things over and over without any of the new information making much of an impact. It kind of becomes an ethnic bounce up something mm -hmm. to, to focus on the family. Mm -hmm. And I know Richard's written a little bit about this problem. Uh, and, and uh, I think uh, taking this cue from the French philosopher Paul Nicole. Give us any hints of how we approach this. Well, I let our four speakers do, do that. Anybody want to? No, I'll just say one thing, Catherine, Future. and that has to do with the internationalism mm -hmm. of the Great Famine. I think <coughs> it's crucial to, I mean, <coughs> Christopher Lash wrote a book about the United States called The Culture of Narcissism. But there is a danger too in some Irish versions of some Irish versions of culture of cultures of narcissism that the Irish tend to think of themselves and themselves only. And what, as the saying goes, what can they know of Ireland who only Ireland know? And I think that really one of the good things that has come out of the commemorations of the Great Famine is to open up the whole question, not just of Ireland in the 1840s, but the role of Ireland within the wider world system, and indeed to raise questions about this, come back to what Michael Foley was talking about, there are the causes, the, the, <coughs> the catalysts, the, the wider picture about 
the, and I think when Mary Robinson linked up her commemoration of the Great Famine to famine in Africa and tried to say, and I think it's called the historical duty argument, that one of, one of the ways you can do justice to the past is by doing justice in the present. And to think of these issues as contemporary issues, not simply. And I think that's what the, the Great Hunger Museum, by bringing images into line with decades, and it, it doesn't just show the 1840s or 50s, and it brings representations of the famine right up to the present. I think, th I think that is really an important we have to discover the present as much as we have to discover the past. Look, I'd, I'd like to press you on that a, a tiny bit um, and, and come back to your opening point in your paper, because you began with the present, you began with the beheading, the image of the beheading, and you said that it's too awful to look at, we have to look away. And I'm sort of curious to see how you pursue that then throughout the talk, insofar as at one level, it seemed to suggest that we look away like the Russians looked away because they couldn't look at the Muslim man. Even the camera slides over them from what is representable to something else that's representable, but not that. We have to look away. And that suggests that we can't have compassion for the Muslim man. We can't have compassion for the victim of the beheading. We look away. And yet at another level, you seem to be saying that looking away is important sometimes to avoid, say, the, soci the society of spectacle, the Guido Bauer syndrome, and that that allows the somatic transfer to occur, where, as you say, the body takes the hit first. We look away, but the body takes the hit, and you use the phrase, and allows for moral imagination. In other words, at some level, you seem to be saying that by not looking at times, right, but there's a limit to the visible, we, the body does some work of embarrassment and shame, that allows space for moral imagination and justice, rather than it being too crowded by compassion. But I'm just interested to see how you tease that out, starting with the beheading, and what do we do in terms of looking appropriately? I mean, <coughs> in the wider argument, which I mm. developed in the pamphlet, in a way I try to bring out that the, the visible is often best served by a kind of withholding. Mm. The image, in other words, a kind of restraint in the image is part of what makes the image visual as against optical, pure, a purely optical sensation. And that's why the phrase just witness is used by Levy and used by others. In other words, the, and it goes back to Michael Foley's question, that if you respond purely visually, Hannah Arendt says, the problem is justice is going to be the casualty. You, you will respond, okay, in, if you like, in a purely somatic way, but it's the just body, it's not just the body per se, it's the body informed by a moral compass. Mm. And it's the body, so in other words, the reason we can move, the imagination can move in, is precisely that that capacity in us, if you like, completes the image. And, in, and the argument about society of the spectacle, Guy, Guy Debord's famous argument is that unfortunately we are living in a, in a society where the image is becoming more and more part of our response to our environment and we're emptying out the possibility of withholding. So there's a book written on the right not to be seen, not just the right, the right to see, but the right not to be seen, the right to have an certain modicum of invisibility, and it goes back to this argument that showing everything blunts a moral response rather than activates a moral response. So, it, it, but it also means that when you're looking at real life events, that's exactly how it responds in real life events, that, and that's where the argument about context comes in, that you, by looking at it per se, you, it's just physically revolting. But when you contextualize it, which is an act of the imagination, that's how you fill in the blind spot. So in a way, I mean, there's a problem, a slight danger of arguing an anti, that the image in- Well, you anti, might have to close down the museum here for starters. Well, in fact, it's the other way around. What the image does is precisely by contextualizing the image and relating different images to each other. <laughs> 
Excellent. Yes, Christine wants to. Uh, just Catherine's point, I think the answer is scholarship. And I think there is so much good scholarship that has taken place since 1995. And I think in my presentation, I had 15 minutes, so it was almost to you, let's all blame and hate Trevelyan. I don't mean it that way, um, sort of Cecil Wooden Smith generation of thinking. But I think that generation is, you know, they're not going to be around forever, and the next generation is exposed to scholarship. And just um, Britain, the role of Britain is, you know, it's multifaceted. So I talked about the British government. There were arguments within the British government, you know, 15 minutes, I didn't have time to cover it. And then the place that sent most money to Ireland during the famine was the British Relief Association. They had 15,000 individual donors, and that committee was put together by bankers in London who had no connection with Ireland. So I think new scholarship is revealing the complexity of the various responses, and the failure of the British government is just one part of that new scholarship. So I think scholarship, and you know, that's why I think what President Leahy do has done is so great in promoting new scholarship. You know, it shouldn't just end because the anniversary years have ended. So I think scholarship is the answer. Here, here. Great. One, one last question and then... Um, thank you. I'm not exactly sure where the question will um, come out of this, but uh, first of all, I'd like to thank those. It was very profitable and fantastic for, for what I'm thinking about at the moment. And, and just to cut to the chase on this, there's a lot of talk about the static image. And I'm interested in the moving image. I'm interested in our, our being able to absorb something as, as devastating and huge, as such a huge part of our history in terms of the moving image. So we have the permanent and we have the ephemeral. We have the words and we have the image and how we can actually embrace this as something that we have to experience and not necessarily turn our eyes away from. I think maybe a good place to start would be by looking at the piece here in the museum by Alana O'Kelly, No Colouring Can Deepen the Darkness of Truth, because that is, a, I think it's about a 10 or 12 minute long film presentation. It involves performance, it involves images of the landscape, it involves um, singing in the Irish language, it involves keening, it involves um, references to the third world, the developing world where famine is still happening and so on. It, it allows for an active engagement over time, a short period of time admittedly, but over the 12 minutes or so that it runs for, that is not about a linear history or about a chronology, but it allows the psyche to engage with all of these things at the same time. I think that might be a place to start. I'm sure other people have. It was just following on from, from the idea of um, Luke's, the somatic response to something. And uh, you know, things that came into mind were William Forsyth's three atmospheric studies, which based on Iraq, the word Iraq, which is contemporary Gatsby, so it's highly incredible. Um, other things, Steve McQueen's um, Gatsby, which is Twelve Years a Slave. Again, you can look at that film probably as a memorial to a certain extent to, to the founding of civil rights in, in our history of America, can't you? So those, those, those things started working in my, in, in my um, thoughts, and I just wondered, not that I'm purporting at all that anybody should make a dance directly on the famine, because I think that's not the point. But the point is, how do we absorb this today? There is a, a very kind of prolonged debate going on in literature and the visual arts, word and image, that once an image moves, it has to become narrative, as in motion pictures. But in fact, I think you put your finger on something that is really important, and that is motion itself, movement itself. The movement of the body is an achievement in Beckett. That the body moves at all is a miracle. And what the idea that restoring motion and rhythm and tone and eloquence to the body through dance, through not just the verbal forms of theatre, but through what might be called performance, performativity. It could be argued that the Irish body wasn't just lacking in sexuality, it was lacking in performativity of the kind that lets the body do the talking. In fact, early theories of acting in the Abbey Theatre 
we're constantly drawing attention to the fact that the words are doing all the work and the body is fretting in the shadow of, of the language. So I think it, what you're saying is really important. I mean, but that's what's remarkable about Steve McQueen's work. The body becomes a kind of an extra form of dialogue and the body itself is trying to say things that cannot be said in speech. So I think in one sense, bringing performance back into Irish culture, not theatre per se, because theatre will have words, will have narrative, will have, but bring in dance, bring in performance. And I'm saying it to you, Jean Butler, because you're one of the, the people who have done most to actually push the boat out on this. So thanks for that. Thank you. And for those who have stuck with us, um, I'm going to fly through our database presentation, which I think you'll enjoy. Uh, several people to thank for this project, starting with Connor Kenny and his team at Kenny's in Galway for sourcing these works for us. We have the hard copy volumes and they performed the first initial digitization phase for us. Secondly, many thanks and sincere gratitude go to Mary Glynn of the Information Systems Department at QU, who's here today, who worked tire tirelessly and with always a smile um, for many hours to bring this database to life. She, along with Nevo Sullivan, the museum's curator, deserve my personal and professional gratitude for a job well done. So thank you both. Um, as I mentioned, this is these are the publications that we have in our collection. We have most 1845 to 52 covered. We are missing one or two volumes, which we are continuing to look for. Um, and the 1845 to 52 of what we have are all digitized in, in the database. Um, we have we also own pre-45 and post-52 documents that are not yet digitized, but we will continue to add them to the database. Um, as we go along. Uh, the functions of the database, and I'll show just a quick demonstration and you'll see the search and the browse in action. Um, you can do it by single keyword, multiple keywords, multiple keywords using and or, um, and the browse function if you want to browse by publication or by year or by keyword, it's all possible. Um, again, the timeline for completion is the, the end of this year, um, and it will be available free to scholars, researchers, and the public, which we're um, very happy about. So here, if we go through a few sample searches, oh, I forgot to have it right here. Um, if we start with uh, a name, Russell, you see in the yellow box under search, it, the search results show that there's 102 results with the word or the name Russell in the collection. So if we go to the next one, we pick on one of the articles that has Russell. It's the Pictorial Times, a street car, a street door at, in Tarmans. And so the text in the OCR source is the text, the actual text of the um, article. And then if we click on the link, here's the image of the article that comes up. Another, and then the keywords, we picked Russell, but if you put in any of these other search words, Irish, children, livestock, great famine, Ireland, it would, it would also bring up that article along with others with those keywords. If we pick a place, we're gonna search Cork. Um, we see that there are over 200 results uh, with this in its search. And if we pick scalpine, a thing, uh, we see that there are 17 um, results. And clicking on one of the results for scalpine, there's an article that involves the work, the workhouse in Clifton. And so here's an image of that. If we combine keywords, ship and coffin, uh, we find 10 results. And if we click on one of them, the Illustrated London News, the depopulation of Ireland, emigration vessel between the decks, and here's the image connected with that article. And if we want a really broad search for those who are not uh, re real researchers or like me, more um, you know, elementary in my um, research skills, the type in Ireland, you see we have more than a thousand results. So you can, we wanted to show that very broad research uh, 
or you can narrow it down with advanced words as well. So if we click on Ireland, here is one of um, relief for Ireland in the pictorial times. Here's an image of that. And then here is the OCR um, for an article that's text-based only. Uh, a crisis is at hand in Ireland. And then here is the image of the actual article. So the image is the text um, as it appears in the paper. And then these three screens show, if you browse Ireland's Great Hunger Museum in the upper left, you see the list of publications, Punch, uh, we have a set of appeal cartoons, Illustrated London News, and, and the two others. In the middle, we, well, let's say we pick Punch, and we clicked on Punch, the years are listed. Um, and then let's say we pick 1849, and we get this screen, and it shows all the phrases and the words um, that appear in the articles in 1849. So you can then search by what you're looking for that way. So um, this will be available, uh, and when it is, it's ac accessible through the museum's website at um, IGHM.org, and we look forward to a lot more research being generated from the use of this great database. Thank you to the authors, uh, Christine, Neve, Catherine, and Luke, and also to Richard for a very um, fulfilling and informative panel discussion, and long, and to all of you for hanging in there, so thank you very much.